the uh, director of heart failure uh, at Montefiore in the Bronx. And uh, we're here for our afternoon cardiology grand rounds. And it's really my extreme pleasure to introduce uh, John Kobashigawa, who is the Thomas Gordon Professor of Medicine and the director of the Advanced Heart Disease Section and the Transplant Program at Cedar sinai Smith Heart Institute. Uh, John is a friend and uh, probably, I think, the number one recognized uh, heart transplant cardiologist in the world, extremely accomplished uh, researcher over the past decades that has really made groundbreaking uh, trans contributions to uh, translational medicine in heart transplantation. Um, the highest honor, I think, for any physician is when other physicians call for advice with uh, complex cases. We will have such a case uh, later on today in our session. Um, I won't go to much detail here. John went uh, to Stanford uh, for college, then came to New York uh, to Mount Sinai School of Medicine and unfortunately defected back to California <laughs> to have a fairly illustrious uh, career at UCLA. But about uh, 10 years ago, eight years ago, uh, moved his entire team uh, to Cedar sinai and Cedar sinai quickly became uh, what I consider the number one uh, heart transplant program, uh, certainly in the United States, if not globally. Uh, John will speak to us today about innovations in rejection surveillance after heart transplantations. Uh, and if it's not evidence on the slide, because he's so humble, I will just say that uh, the majority of this research was either directed by him or he participated in it. So John, Thank you very much. It's great to see you and uh, please take it away. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Jordi. Um, you know, Uli has been a friend of mine for decades at this point in time. And certainly I hold uh, you and your program in high esteem uh, as well. So certainly you lead the charge in uh, transplantation medicine, along with MCS uh, and many other programs uh, and uh, uh, specialties uh, throughout advanced heart disease. So uh, I've been asked to speak on innovations in rejection surveillance after heart transplantation. So let me get right into this. And here is my disclosure. Well, let me set the stage because I know that not all of you are uh, attuned to heart transplantation. So the next three slides would just set the stage as to where we are. And then I'll get into the uh, surveillance uh, after transplantation. Now, these three slides are from the International Heart Transplant Registry. Uh, you can see transplantation rather began here in the United States in 1982 when cyclosporin became available. And you can see the number of transplants increased dramatically over the uh, 1980s, uh, plateaued in the 1990s, dipped a little bit in the 2000s, and actually come back to about 5,000 transplants throughout the world, most of them uh, being performed uh, here in North America, meaning the U.S. and in Canada. So why do patients undergo heart transplantation? Well, for the most part, you can look at the figure to your right, and that represents uh, the uh, etiologies uh, for heart transplant. In white, uh, represents cardiomyopathy. Usually, this is viral cardiomyopathy in general, about 51%, and that's the most recent era. And you can see only about 32% are due to coronary artery disease. When you look at the figure to the left, uh, which in encompasses uh, all eras, you can see we're actually getting better in the treatment of coronary disease um, and uh, these patients are undergoing less trans, uh, need for transplantation. And so patients ask me all the time, well, how long will I live with a new uh, heart? Will I live forever? Well, not quite. Now this is again from the registry and each color represents eras over time. And the blue line represents the most early era from 1982 to 1991. And the more recent era is in purple. Uh, or lavender, as you can see, uh, which is at the very top. So yes, we've actually done better, but usually you'll see this only in the first year where we've done better. And the lines more or less are parallel you know, uh, after the first year. Well, what represents the most common cause of death in the first year after transplant? Well, it's still rejection followed by infection. And so that's why we still are very concerned about rejection. And that's why you know, we'll talk about surveillance for rejection in the next few slides. Now, what about the parallel lines here? The parallel lines represent uh, death mostly due to two things. One is chronic rejection, what we call cardiac allograft vasculopathy. It's a form of chronic rejection, if you will. And the other reason is because of cancer. Malignancy is actually 
gaining ground even on uh, this chronic rejection of cardiac allogravascularopathy. But to that note, we'll talk about surveillance of how we view or how we can surveil for this chronic rejection, again, known as cardiac allogravascularopathy. So let me get right into it now in terms of the surveillance uh, uh, talk that we're gonna be looking at. The search for reliable non-invasive means for acute and chronic rejection surveillance continues. Now the endomyocardial biopsy to which to compare biomarkers does not appear to be the true gold standard and we'll get into that. Now, is there a better way to interpret these biopsies? And finally, can we accurately surveil for chronic rejection, cardiac allograft vasculopathy without the need for an annual coronary angiograms? Well, maybe so. And so for the next few minutes, let me talk about these innovations in rejection surveillance. We'll talk about acute rejection surveillance. Uh, the more recent uh, biomarker is donor-derived cell-free DNA. Uh, then we'll turn to defining rejection with a molecular microscope. Is this better than the read from pathologists uh, uh, on the end of myocardial biopsy? And we call that intrograph mRNA transcripts. And then finally, we'll turn to chronic rejection surveillance using the cardiac eye box to pr predict uh, CAV trajectories. The eye box represents uh, precision medicine or big data, if you will. So let's turn our attention now to this uh, acute rejection surveillance. Now, just a few words about the uh, gene expression profiling, because I think that does lead and uh, lead the way into cell-free DNA. Well, we looked at, many of us have looked at uh, gene expression profiling with the company uh, CareDx, and, and together they came up with a combination of genes that are the fingerprint of rejection. Now, this comes from the CARGO-2 trial, where basically they looked at 25,000 genes, which is actually, that's it for the human uh, genome came from the Genome Project uh, two de three decades ago. And out of these 25,000 genes, they came down to 11 genes that are involved in the acute cellular rejection pathway. Now, this is a fingerprint of rejection. Now, you might think it represents all these immune-related uh, genes, but actually not so. You know, uh, these genes are in various categories. Uh, there are several in each category, T-cell priming, proliferation and mobilization of erythrocytes, Plate, platelet activation, steroid responsiveness, and there are some unknown roles as well, but all 11 genes are in, in these categories here. And so um, the issue here was that the study that was done was called the IMAGE trial, and we'll get right into that. But this, again, only uh, pertained to cellular rejection and not antibody-mediated rejection. So this was the IMAGE trial, 602 patients randomized you know, basically half to genome expression profiling, the simple blood test, or to the usual uh, endomyocardial biopsy group. Now, biopsies were performed not only the first year, but second, third, and fourth year after transplantation in these groups. And so it didn't all represent just the early first year transplants. And in fact, it started off with two years plus and then moved backwards to one year. And so a very small uh, minority of patients, you know, less than 20%, were actually enrolled at uh, beginning at six months after transplant. Well, what did they find? Not surprising, actually the same. You know, in terms of the biopsy or the genome expression profiling, if you looked at the uh, primary endpoint, it was a combination of uh, two-year incidence of composite endpoint of hemodynamic compromise rejection, which is severe rejection, graft dysfunction, death, and or retransplant, and was similar between the gene profiling group and the biopsy group. All right, so at least we have something to tell us whether or not there's cellular rejection that's there or not. What about antibody-mediated rejection? Because that's really taken on a life of its own, actually, in terms of its uh, you know, designation and also in terms of its interpretation. And now we have better ways to detect antibodies and for antibody-mediated rejection as well. So how do we do this? Well, let's turn our attention to DNA, the molecule of life. Well, we all know that each one of us individually, we have our own DNA. That's what differentiates us from the next person, unless you happen to be an identical twin. Who out there is an identical twin? Well, actually I am. So if you see me out there, that's my evil twin brother. He actually is a dentist out there. So 
don't worry, uh, I won't be working on his uh, patient's teeth and he won't be working on my patient's heart at this point in time. All right, well, let's get back to the DNA the molecule of life. Well, when you think about it, the donor heart is coming from someone else, right? Who's got another, the separate DNA of its, of its own. Well, let's say you do have rejection and you start to have um, myocyte necrosis and you get release of the donor uh, derived DNA into the bloodstream, which does happen. The question is, can you detect it? And the answer is yes. Selfie DNA is found in circulating blood. Selfie DNA is released from healthy inflamed or diseased tissue from cells undergoing apoptosis, meaning programmed cell death or necrosis. Selfie DNA can be extracted from a blood sample and analyzed. And there is a steady state uh, level due to basal rate of cellular turnover. You know, in all of us, uh, many of our cells turn over regularly. And that is about six nanograms per mil of plasma of 1,000 genomes per mil. So yeah, you can actually detect it. And now with our new technologies, we can actually detect donor-derived cell-free DNA. In other words, what's coming from the donor. And what, they, what the company has done is they've taken the uh, ratio of donor-derived cell-free DNA over the total body recipient's cell-free DNA. And that way we have some standardization to see whether or not rejection is ongoing or not. So has that been done? And the answer is yes, it has. Now, this is a very nice study by uh, Agbor and colleagues. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Palak Shah was also a co-first uh, uh, author as well. And this represents the GRAFT consortium, a, a group of uh, transplant programs around the, uh, the NIH and Hannah Valentine for the NIH also was, in, uh, was instrumental in spearheading this consortium. So altogether, this was a multi-center prospective study of 171 heart transplant patients with a median post-transplant follow-up of 17 months. 1,834 plasma samples with uh, a percentage of donor-derived cell-free DNA was measured by shotgun sequencing and were collected uh, contemporaneously with 1,392 biopsies. Now, histopathology data was collected to define acute rejection uh, and its two phenotypes, both acute cellular rejection and antibody cellular reje uh, so antibody mediated rejection, and of course, controls without rejection. Now, the primary analysis was to compare cell-free DNA levels for acute rejection, again, both for antibody mediated rejection and acute cellular rejection, compare them to controls. All right, so what did they find? Well, this is what they found. They looked initially at the time course of when cell-free DNA would actually uh, become plateaued. Actually, when you take the heart out, you, you get a lot of cutting and you get a lot of exposure of donor-derived cell-free DNA. So we expect it to be high right at the time of transplant. And that's what you see in this curve. And quite interestingly, you'll see the curve come down very nicely. So by one to two months, the cell-free DNA is almost at plateau meaning at a baseline at that point in time. So that's when cell-free DNA becomes reasonable to, de to look to detect the rejection in our heart transplant patients. So it's very nice to see this timeline and more or less stays the same. It doesn't increase over time. And that's what we see in genome expression profiling. We'll see that level actually increase over time. But if you look at cell-free DNA, it stays rather flat. All right, so you know what do they find at that point in time? Well, they found this. This is looking at acute cellular rejection on your, light, on your left and antibody media rejection on your right. When you look at acute cellular rejection, you see the blue bar to the right, that's acute cellular rejection grade greater than or equal to grade two. Now grade two is what we treat. This is what we call moderate rejection. This is when we see myocyte necrosis. In grade one, you will not see myocyte necrosis. And that's why when you look at the grade one, which is mild rejection, that's why you don't really see an elevation in the cell-free DNA because there's no myocyte necrosis. You just see cells that are infiltrating the graft, but again, very mild level of cellular infiltration. But when you get to that grade two, and by definition, you see myocyte necrosis, that's when you see an elevated cell-free DNA makes sense. You know, so you know, when we looked at this type of graph and data, we go, wow, it does look like cell-free DNA is pretty good at detecting cellular rejection. Now, what about antibody media rejection? Well, sometimes it's difficult to really ascertain that because you have to have two definitions, so, you know, fulfill two definitions. One is immunopathology. Yeah, you have to see cell, you know, some uh, complement fragmentations. 
uh, you'll see CD68, which is uh, for um, uh, macrophages. And then you ought to see histologic findings, meaning endothelial cell swelling, and, and also lineup of um, macrophages within the vascular system. If you have those two, histopathology uh, and immunopathology together, that equals AMR2. So when you see AMR2 or greater, meaning grade three is severe antibody immune rejection, you can see cell-free DNA is even higher than you see in cellular rejection, at least in this study. And so it just tells you that, you know what, it does make a difference to detect antibody immune rejection, and even grade one is detected here over baseline. So antibodies may indeed have a significant account for uh, the development or detection of cell-free DNA. Ah. What they did here, the graph consortium was very interesting too. Not only did they look at pathology, but they looked at graph dysfunction. Now here you see severity of left ventricular rejection fraction decrease or drop. It could be mild, moderate, or severe. When you look at severe, more than a 15% drop in ejection fractions, let's say from 55% to 40%. And that's what they meant by absolute uh, decrease in ejection fraction. And you can see that when you have increasing uh, graft dysfunction by increasing decrease by decrease in the ejection fraction, you have more release of cell-free DNA. Again, makes sense, right? More uh, graft dysfunction, you should see more uh, donor-derived cell-free DNA being released. And that's exactly what you see here. Now, I wanted to put something in perspective as well, and that is antibodies. When you have donor-specific antibodies that are circulating around, does your cell-free DNA actually go up? And the answer is yes. This is from our cohort in the, uh, in the registry study from, uh, from uh, CARE-DX. And what we demonstrated here is that when you have quiescence, even when antibodies are around, AMR is zero, uh, but we have a highly sensitized uh, group uh, population, and you can see that the basal level is increased by more than twofold when you have quiescence in the, in the face of uh, uh, circulating antibodies. But just something to keep in mind when you look at the results of these uh, cell-free DNA, particularly if you have uh, circulating uh, donor-specific antibody. And we can get uh, into that too in the Q&A if you desire. All right, so what are the clinical implications? Well, donor-derived cell-free DNA demonstrated significant higher levels in acute rejection, uh, PMR greater than or equal to two, and a acute cellular rejection greater than or equal to two R versus controls and provides a framework to use donor-derived cell-free DNA to differentiate AMR and ACR. Not, again, it, it's not quite because maybe a higher level represents AMR, but again, it really depends on uh, the uh, acuteness of the uh, uh, acute study rejection. So starting at 28 days after heart transplant, the use of donor-derived cell-free DNA threshold, and they used it greater than 0.25%, had a negative predictive value of acute rejection of 99%, and would have safely eliminated 81% of all surveillance endomyocardial biopsies in their consortium. So quite good in terms of uh, not having to do biopsies and saving a lot in terms of uh, resources. Well, let me now move on to defining rejection with the uh, molecular microscope using intrograph mRNA transcripts. Well, let's look at the endomyocardial biopsy. So currently, the gold standard for rejection surveillance is the invasive endomyocardial biopsy. Now, among expert pathologists, there is only a 67, two-thirds concordance to identify rejection in the heart biopsy. When you looked at the CARGO-2 trial, there was only a 28% concordance for moderate rejection or 2R rejection. Uh, that's even less than a coin flip to tell you the truth. So therefore there is an unmet need for a reliable test to detect heart transplant rejection. And so what are the intrinsic problems with the biopsy? Well, the definition of lesions in the biopsy is based on expert consensus and not on clinical outcomes. Grading is modeled on morphologic features and not on functional or pathological evaluations. For example, we see lymphocytes in the biopsy, but we do not know if they are exerting a cytotoxic activity or maybe they're just passengers. You know, traditional histology methods are often subjective with concordance among pathologists as low as 28%, as I mentioned, um, uh, for cardiac transplant uh, to our rejection. Um, 
And again, and why, and why would we see all this? Well, there's artifact, as we know. And, and this is what we might see in terms of artifact, the, an old biopsy site. You know, and for those of you who do biopsies, you know that biotome tends to go in that same direction to the same area of the right, uh, you know, the right ventricular septum. Uh, so it's common for the biotome to be guided to the same position. So maybe you'll see repair. And sometimes that repair can look like rejection. What about infection? This is more or less very rare to have cytomegalovirus or toxoplasma to infect the heart. Yeah, you'll see cells that look like rejection. And have we been fooled about that? To tell you the truth, yes, I have. You know, many year, years ago, we had a patient who had toxo, was really not very symptomatic, but when we did the biopsy, <laughs> we found some toxo cysts. Um, it did look like rejection as well. And finally, there's quilty effect. This first described by uh, Dr. Margaret Billingham in 1981. Um, it's named after a patient, uh, Joseph Quilty, by the way, not after a doctor. Uh, it occurs in 10 to 20% of the heart biopsies. And this is lymphocytic lesions with B and T cell infiltrates. It almost looks like PTLD, to tell you the truth, but it, it is not. And actually, it's not been found to have any deleterious effects or prognostic effects as well. And considered by some to be a side effect of cyclosporin. And yes, we see it in the trochromus era as well. All right, so let's now turn our attention to intragraph mRNA transcripts. This molecular phenotyping offers a possibility for increased accuracy in diagnosing and treating pathologic states. Now, traditional hist histolog histological methods are often subjective, meaning the eyes of the pathologist, and results are you know, qualitative. By relating gene expression to disease states, a system can be created to diagnose pathologies. Halloran and uh, Phil Halloran you know, and colleagues at the University of Alberta devised a system for identifying rejection and allograph injury in transplant biopsy samples. They call it the molecular microscope diagnostic system. And so what is this all about? You know, how does it work? Well, they use microarrays to analyze mRNA in biopsy samples suspended in RNA lathe, a region called RNA, RNA lather. Machine learning builds algorithms that assign probability of disease states known as classifiers. And I'll get into that as well. A classifier algorithm uses multiple gene expression values in contrast to traditional gene uh, sets. So we're looking at pathways. We're looking at classifiers where activation of pathways that are, are suggestive of cellular rejection, of antibody immune rejection, or, or maybe just injury pattern. So this new biopsy results are compared to a 50 nearest neighbor, uh, neighbors in a reference set. And when we get into uh, the molecular microscope, I'll show you examples of what we're actually talking about. And so the molecular landscape of rejection use, uses these rejection-associated transcripts, you know, what we call rats, you know, as classifiers. Now, as I mentioned, we'll look at the T-cell, uh, TCMR, T-cell media rejection landscape. And we'll look at like CTLA-4 signaling, T-cell receptor signaling, dendritic cell differentiation, and interferon gamma, uh, gamma mediated effects. These are just you know, small representations of these pathways that are activated in T-cell mediated rejection. Now, what about antibody mediated rejection in the landscape? Natural killer cell signaling, endothelium activation, leukocyte extracellular interactions, and some overlap with, again, with inter gamma interferon mediated effects and many, many more. So you can see that these uh, pathways, these classifiers that are activated are, are different. They're clustered into different groups to represent uh, you know, different types of rejection or no rejection, or maybe just injury pattern by itself. So how do we actually do this from a, a statistical standpoint? They use archetype analysis. Archetype analysis estimates the probability of no rejection, T cell rejection, antibody rejection, injury that I don't have here in a single endomyocardial bite. Archetype analysis is an unsupervised method that assigns each biopsy a score based on its similarity to cases in the reference set. The scores up to, uh, add up to 1.0 you know, up to 100%. Gives you probabilities of whether you're in T cell media rejection, antibody rejection, cell, uh, injury pattern, or no rejection by itself. Now, quite interesting, what Dr. Uh, Halloran did is he not only looked at heart, he looked at kidney, he looked at lung in addition to heart to see 
what classifiers were being activated? Are they similar amongst each solid organ group? And what did he find? Well, they looked pretty darn close together in terms of what pathways were being activated. In, uh, to your left is kidney, and that represents uh, you know, 1,208 kidney samples. Uh, in heart, uh, 331 samples, and in lung, only 58 samples. So that's why you see very few uh, you know, uh, 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 dots that are out there. In red represents no rejection. In blue represents T cell media rejection. Now these are these classifiers. These are these activation pathways. And in green represents uh, uh, antibody media rejection. It's similar, whether you look at kidney, heart, or lung, the same classifiers are being activated. Now, this is the reference set, okay? So this is where, you know, all of those uh, classifiers lie in this, uh, in this clustering of activated uh, uh, pathways, you know, that are prominent in many of these forms of rejection. And so where do we go from here? Well, let's look at heart. And we'll look at inter-heart study. This is a prospective validation of the molecular microscope in heart transplantation. You know, assign molecular scores of T-mediated cell rejection, antibody mediated rejection in a reference set of 200 you know, biopsies, all right? So now we have some reference set clustering of which pathways are being activated. It'll be very similar to what you just saw on the previous slide. It creates a molecular classifiers that predict antibody mediated rejection and T-cell mediated rejection. All right, so you know, how do we classify it at this point in time? You know, as I mentioned, there's rejection pathways, uh, no rejection, T cell media rejection, antibody media rejection, injury, which is no rejection, and just minor, minor uh, rejection like changes. Okay, so again, you know, that uh, suggests maybe something is going on. Now, an injury pattern. Now we can actually look at all these injury patterns, you know, uh, no injury, early, mild, late, severe, early to moderate. And as it turns out, the late and severe injury patterns actually have prognostic indicators. This is when you have decrease in uh, cardiac function or decrease in allograft function, something that we're still working on uh, with Phil and the interheart uh, group. So let's give an example of what we actually see. Now, the orange triangle where the black arrow is pointing to represents your patient's biopsy, which uh, the uh, mRNA transcript suggests in this case, it's lying right over the reference set, which is antibody immediate rejection with a very high probability. So when you look at these pathways, it's actually not just you know, you know, two-dimensional, it's actually three-dimensional. We actually flip it from um, this principal component one to principal component two. So it's like the three-dimensional pathways that you see here. And that's why when you look at it in different angles, you see different uh, uh, probabilities. And in this situation, the probability is still remains high, and no matter how you look at it from uh, principal component one or two. In this, uh, in this set. And so in this set, antibody immune rejection is essentially 98%, 100%. And so, yeah, I think you can assume that this is indeed, you know, antibody immune rejection. And so where do we go from here? Well, we look at the real world experience now, and this is done by my, our, our, our colleague, Luciano Potena from Italy, who did some very nice, interesting real world look with uh, the molecular microscope. What he did was he looked at patients undergoing heart biopsy for protocol surveillance or for clinical suspicion of rejection you know, were included in the study. During the endomyocardial biopsy, they did hemodynamics of red heart cath. All patients underwent uh, ultrasound, meaning uh, echocardiography and clinical evaluation. And one of the biopsy samples were sent to Edmonton in the University of Alberta for the molecular microscope. So what did this actually include? Well, it included 281 endomyocardial biopsies from 131 patients transplanted between 1985 to 2018. It doesn't mean that they had the biopsy back in 1985, but this patient just happened to be out. And that's why you see months after transplant, 350 months, that's that person who was transplanted back in 1985, had something going on to uh, warrant an endomyocardial biopsy. So 34 females or 26%, and the average age was 52 years of age. And the myocardial biopsy uh, performed at a median time of nine months after heart transplantation. And so now you see that Dr. Patena had time, time to draw curves as to when certain things would happen. And this is what he found. Now I found this to be very interesting and maybe a little bit contentious in the sense. 
Well, well, let's look at this. When you look at yellow, this is the uh, antibody media rejection. And that's, you can see it increases quite dramatically and it goes up and down and then over time increases. So this is antibody media rejection increases over time. Well, now let's look at the blue line, T cell media rejection. It increases early on and then dips down and more or less plateaus in about that 10% range again over time as well. What's interesting is this, look at that injury. Now it makes sense too. Injury because the, is, the heart is just going in, it's got a lot of injury pattern, ischemia reperfusion injury. You can see that at the very, in the red line, big time, you know, in the first month after transplantation. And then you see it more or less tapers off, uh, you know, about a little five to 6% over time as well. And so does that early rejection, at least what we're seeing in early rejection, is it really early rejection or is it injury pattern? And so Dr. Patina took a look at that, looked at the transcripts, and this is what he found. Now, half of the false positives of histology are related to cellular rejection diagnosed in the first month after transplant when it actually <laughs> represents injury pattern. And you can see the first month injury pattern, uh, the uh, classifiers are way up compared to after one month when it actually goes dips below the standard line. And so maybe indeed all this first, first month rejection that we're seeing in high levels is actually just injury. And maybe the molecular microscope or intrograph and RNA transcripts can actually detect this. Well, okay, so what did Dr. Patena do? He looked at the biopsies. This is acute cellular rejection. Um, and in this situation, you looked at 2R rejection. And the bright red represents injury. How about that? In the dark red at the very top represents that injury, that mixed, maybe there's something going on. But you can see that a lot of that, maybe, you know, maybe half or maybe more than half of 2R rejection in that first month could represent injury pattern. So maybe we are overreading. Maybe we're overtreating our patients that have that first you know, month uh, rejection episode when it truly may, may represent injury or ischemia reperfusion injury as opposed to true rejection. Stay tuned, more to follow on that as well. Now, what about antibody media rejection? Well, when you look at uh, AMR one and two, you know, in pink represents, you know, the um, antibody media rejection. So that's right on, you know, in terms of the classifiers, what pathways are being activated, meaning, yes, pathways for antibody media rejection. But again, we're seeing a, a lot of uh, this injury pattern in AMR two. And above that, maybe some mixed rejection, or I should say mixed injury, Maybe there's some indication that something is going on, but maybe up to 40% or less actually represents injury pattern again, particularly in that first month after heart transplantation. So again, maybe, just maybe we're over-treating our patients uh, and maybe it does represent more injury ischemia reperfusion injury to say the least. All right, now we talked about cell-free DNA and now we have this intrograph mRNA transcript. And of course, we have the endomyocardial cardiobiopsy. Well, how does the cell-free DNA and the molecular microscope stack up when you compare both to the uh, endomyocardial cardiobiopsy? So yeah, we actually did a study looking at this back a number of years ago. Between 2016 and 2017, we reviewed 16 biopsy samples from 10 patients who had donor-derived cell-free DNA uh, drawn at the same time. Uh, that endomyocardial sam samples were obtained, again, for mRNA transcripts and for routine biopsy pathology. Now, an elevated donor-derived cell-free DNA, now we used a very high you know, threshold of 0.5% to say, yeah, that's real rejection. And we correlated that to intergraph mRNA transcripts where there is a greater than a 50% probability for either AMR or ACR, you know, antibody media rejection or cellular rejection. And of course, we compared both and all to the endomyocardial biopsy, um, and we were looking for acute cell rejection greater than 2R, uh, greater or equal to 2R, or antibody media rejection greater than or equal to AMR1, meaning AMR1 and 2 for the most part. So what did we actually find? Well, we looked at the donor drive cell-free DNA. Was it correct correlation to rejection or to no rejection? Did it make the right call? Now, in 12 of 16 uh, of these biopsies, it it compared favorably to the pathology, pathology read, 
<laughs> when we compared cell-free DNA to the intergraph mRNA transcripts, it was 100%. Okay, then we looked at the rejection in the donor-derived cell-free DNA, again, greater than a 50% uh, probability. Five out of seven, there were seven rejection episodes. Five out of seven, 71% was correct in pathology. Seven out of seven was correct in intergraph mRNA transcripts correlating with donor-derived cell-free DNA. So maybe, just maybe, these are better uh, 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 indicators of true rejection. Stay tuned, more to follow on that because there are some trials that are ongoing. The trifecta trial, for example, that's looking just at the selfie DNA, intergraph MRI transcripts, and pathology. Maybe that will tell us what is the true uh, uh, gold standard for rejection. Stay tuned, more to follow on that as well. Okay, so finally, let us turn our attention to chronic rejection surveillance. And here we'll use a cardiac eye box to predict the CAB trajectories. So what is the cardiac eye box? Well, the cardiac eye box is big data, basically thousands and thousands of data points that are emanating not only at baseline, but throughout the first year after transplantation. And because of that, can we use this big data to then predict what's going to happen to that patient in terms of various trajectories? Yeah, we're gonna look at cardiac allograft vasculopathy, meaning that chronic rejection, but also it has implications for survival as well. All right, so when we look at the cardiac eye box, we're looking at various uh, you know, uh, modalities or factors. We'll look at immunology uh, factors, like what's going on in terms of not only the rejection, but also in terms of you know, chemokines, cytokines that are being activated. We'll look at biology, non-invasive mar biomarkers, gene expression, profile and histology of the biopsy, the clinical aspect, what's happening to these patients? Are they having graft dysfunction? Are they having uh, you know, arrhythmias that might uh, mimic uh, rejection per se? And then we take all of this data and we use it under various statistical analysis, collinearities, performance, discrimination, calibration, validation, competing risks, adaptability, and machine learning and algorithmic decision-making occurs. You know, algorithm can synthesize multiple variables and quantify risk. And when we put this all together, what do we have? We have diagnostic risk prediction. So have we actually used this? Well, all the credit goes to Alexander Lupi and his colleagues at the, at the Paris uh, Transplant uh, Group. Not a group of mostly nephrologists, but there are some cardiologists that are involved in this, involved in this as well. And they came up with a study that we were a part of as well. And this is called identification of uh, graph trajectories of cardiac allograft vasculopathy. And this is the study design. Now, there were over 1,300 patients that were involved in the study. Uh, about half were from France and from the La Petite Hospital and Pompidou Hospital in France. These are two of the largest programs. And they have extensive databases. Well, you know, this is such, you know, socialized medicine. So they really do have a great database, you know, for all of their patients per se. Well, this was a discovery phase. So they needed to have a validation cohort that also was very large, but also had an extensive database. And that was Levon, Levon in Belgium, which has a great transplant program, and Cedar Sinai here in the United States. You know, our database is very large as well. We do do a large number of patients. So we were the validation cohorts. So you can imagine all the data that was put into this computer banks, you know, looking at the baseline, uh, the baseline risk factors you can see here, donor characteristics, recipient characteristics, et cetera, et cetera, just all of the uh, uh, risk factors that we can think of. All the endomyocardial biopsy results were uh, put into the computer uh, database. And then at one year, we looked at uh, what was going on with the first year angiogram, which was important. You know, anti-HLA antibodies, MDRD for renal function, immunosuppression, statin therapy, anything that could, you know, uh, uh, basically affect outcome of our patient population. So again, we came up with 1,301 patients. And so how did we actually look at this? Through latent class mixed modeling. And this is uh, basically an unsupervised method adapted to repeated measures allowing the detection of underlying groups in longitudinal data. Statistical parameters are tested to obtain the best profiles of CAV trajectories. And this latent class mixed model uh, associates logistic regression and uh, mixed modeling. So basically we're looking at like cluster analysis, uh, so to speak. 
you know, in this figure here, you'll see all 1,301, you know, uh, trajectories of our patient population. Then we'll put them into clusters and see which one of these actually go together per se. And this is the equation that is used for each patient undergoing, you know, their analysis uh, in terms of what their trajectory would look like. All right. Well, we did look at the, some baseline characteristics because there were some differences between them. And when you look at Paris, you know, Levon, Cedar sinai we looked at recipient age. And true to fact, in the United States, we actually do older patients. Our average age is 56. And the average age across the country is about that, 54 to 56 years of age as well. And look at Paris, 47 years of age, and Levon, 49 years of age. And these were statistically significant. So we're doing older people in uh, the US. But when we look at the age of the donors, look at this. The average age of donors in the US at Cedar sinai 34 years. That's true. We do younger donors. In Paris, 45 years of age. In Levon, 38 years of age. Highly significant differences. Now, why does it make a difference? Well, let's face it, older donors have more transplant vasculopathy, okay? So I just want you to remember that as well, because when we look at the data, you'll see some differences as well. All right, now let's put all this data together. What were the results? What did the Paris group actually find? This is what they found. They found four trajectories, you know, four classes, if you will. Well, let's look at class one and class four. Those are the extremes. When you look at class one, look at that the line for the development of cardiac allograft vasculopathy is flat. These patients are not going to develop cardiac allograft vasculopathy. And that, that included 54.4% of the French cohort. So in 54% of these patients, hello, don't do anything. You don't need to do angiograms on these patients. Leave them alone as long as you know, they maintain their more or less stable state. Okay, so what about class four? Well, these are patients that already established cardiac allograft vasculopathy, and that was 15% of their patient population. And these are the patients you should really hone in on. These are the ones that are going to have progression of their cardiac allograft vasculopathy. <laughs> what can you do? I don't know. I mean, maybe add, you know, proliferational signal inhibitors, keep, keep track of the blood pressure, keep track of the diabetes. I think there are some things that can be done in this patient population. All right. So, how did this look in the validation phase in terms of Levon and Cedar sinai Let's look at it on the right is Cedar sinai and it was more or less identical. All right, when you looked at the latent class one, remember in, uh, at uh, Paris, 54% of the patients were in class one. When you look at our group by Cedar sinai 74.9%, 75% of our patients are in class one. Now we took it out to 10 years, actually. What do we do? We leave them alone. We don't do angiograms on these patients during class one. And uh, we, you know, we determined that we were gonna do angiograms at year five and 10, every five years, just to make sure we're on the right track on our patient population. But it certainly has influenced what we do. Now, when we look at class four, trajectory four, you see that risk increase. These are the ones that we really hone in on. Remember in Paris, it was 15%. At Cedar sinai it's 6%. Now, why the difference? Again, older donors. You know, they have older donors in Paris, and that's why they have more transplant vasculopathy. We're actually fortunate that we have a little bit less. But with 6%, we can certainly hone in on those 6% of patients to truly make sure we've got, you know, a good... Uh, uh, preventive measures ongoing, hypertension, diabetes, et cetera, uh, that we can really try to keep track of these patients. We'll see if it makes a difference or not. Well, let's move on. Now, what actually is the reason for this? Now, we looked at univariate analysis. I won't go into all of these factors, but all of these factors came out as potentially you know, possible risk factors. When we looked at multivariate analysis, we came up with this. Six factors in addition to the first year endomyocardial biopsy. When you look at donor factors, there were three. Age of the donor, no surprise. The older the donor, more transplant vasculopathy. Male gender, smoking of the donor. How about that? Well, how about uh, recipient risk factors? One year LDL cholesterol greater than uh, one, gram per, uh, one gram per liter or 100 milligrams per cent. Immunology, class two in circuit antibodies. We know DQ, DQ and HLA antibodies, are highly associated with transplant vasculopathy. And look at this, 
episode of first year acute salivary rejection. And actually that's being borne out more and more as opposed to antibody media rejection in this cohort as well. And so let me just scroll right through this. Because when we put this on an online calculator, so you, everyone can actually put their own data from these six, uh, at, you know, six uh, risk factors and see what happens. Now, I'll show you an example of this. You know, you can say donor age, 36, female gender of the donor. Yes, there was smoking. No, uh, his cholesterol was okay. No antibodies and uh, CAV graded one year, it was zero. And so how do we look at this and put it into a computer? Well, this is what comes of it. The cardiac vasculopathy trajectory uh, of this patient is mostly characterized by trajectory one. The predicted CAV slope per year is literally zero. The probability to have an increase of CAV grade over 10 years is 7%, you know, with cardiovascular risk factor control. And so quite striking that this can actually occur. But there's more than that. Why? In terms of survival. You know, when you look at trajectory one, at 10 years, an 80% chance they're going to be alive. Pretty darn good. If you look at trajectory four, 51%, you know, at trajectory four. Now, you might say, well, if you look at the ISHLT registry, you know, 10-year survival is 50%. So what, what goes with this trajectory four? But remember, these are all survivors to one year. That's, they had to survive for one year to get that, uh, to get that one year data. And so when you look at... Uh, now, outcome for conditional survival at one year to 10 years, it should be somewhere in that 70% or greater, not 50%. So, you know, it's quite striking that you see this poor outcome for those survivors of one year to survive at 10 years uh, at best. All right, so what do we make of this cardiac eye box? Well, I won't go into all of this, but what's really exciting and that's being evaluated by the FDA, is to use the cardiac eye box maybe as a secondary endpoint for clinical trials. Well, right now, a lot of the clinical trials that we're doing right now, the tozolizumab study, the NIH study, is a one-year study. And wow, would we like to know what happens at five and 10 years, right? But are they gonna do a study that lasts 10 years? I doubt it, why? Because they can't afford to do it. And anyway, at the end of 10 years, that's yesterday's news. You can, we're on to something new. Well, what if you could apply the cardiac eye box to that first year data to see whether or not the tozolizumab is better than placebo in terms of 10 year outcome and in terms of the trajectory of the CAV? Stay tuned, more to follow on that as well. So in summary, use of cell-free DNA to detect rejection may be an alternative to the invasive heart biopsy. Intragraph mRNA transcripts may be reliable adjunct to determine rejection in heart transplant biopsies. Precision medicine may be utilized to predict CV trajectories in heart transplant patients to customize immune therapies, and the future of heart transplant will rest on further understanding of genomic molecular science, such as cell-free DNA, intragraph mRNA transcripts, and further understanding of precision medicine. And with that in mind, I'd like to thank you from sunny Southern California. Terrific, John. That was a uh, really incredible uh, tour de force on an extremely uh, complex uh, topic. I I'll give you the uh, most important quality data now that the attrition rate from beginning to end is under 10%, which is quite exceptional <laughs> because you have general cardiologists in this audience. So it was great. Let me uh, start uh, and welcome if Snehalind uh, Patel, who, as you know, is the director of our heart transplant program, and Yogita Rochlani, who is one of the attendings uh, into the panel. And I'm going to start uh, with a few questions that came uh, in the chat. Uh, the first question is from Danny Sims, I think who you also know, who is also one of the transplant attendings. And he says, thank you, fantastic talk. Our pathologists sometimes see evidence of both ACR and AMR in patients with concern for rejection. Per the molecular microscope, does this happen? And you get both kinds of rejection at once, or is it just AMR and injury? No, you will actually see both light up at the same time. And so, yes, it, it does discriminate nicely for both and in conjunction with, in, in addition to each other. So, yeah. We do actually see that, and you actually see that uh, your your triangle actually be on both sides of both the uh, the antibody mediated rejection and cellular rejection at the same time. So yeah, 
and as you probably know too, mixed rejection has you know uh, less good outcome <laughs> in terms of following these patients out. So once you start to see mixed rejection, it does have some uh, prognostic indicators as well. Okay, very good. Another question about, whoops, my screen just jumped on me here. Uh, another question about the molecular uh, microscope, actually. Let me see. Um, this is from Sasha Vukelic, who is also actually spent, I think, a month with you at some point uh, in LA doing this fellowship here. So Sasha says, uh, amazing talk. How much sample selection bias is interfering with result of microarray analysis of biopsy in the molecular microscope as only one sample is used, i.e., I think you already got the question. If you have the sample that you use for your microarray from a previous biopsy site, it will show pattern of injury despite patient having, for example, uh, ACR. That's so cool. question, uh, yeah. how much can you learn from one sample? What if the uh, sample <clears throat> is from a prior biopsy site, even possibly a recent biopsy site? Yes, you know, that, that is a conundrum that we see. Now, if you're asking for reproducibility, the reproducibility is almost 100%. In other words, if you do the sample, same sample over and over again, you come up with the same uh, results. And so you do have some bias, and that's why Phil is actually asking for two, <laughs> two biopsy samples now, you know, rather than one. So yes, but you know, you're going to be looking at, uh, you know, the, the worst case scenario, whether or not, if you have a biopsy site and you may see some, and many times you'll see that, you'll, be, you'll see some scarring, and then you'll see some activity, and that'll give you an idea of whether or not you have actually something going on in that light as well. But you see both, just like you'll see both mixed rejection, you'll see injury, and you'll see you know, activity at the same time. So I, I, I still think it's worthwhile. Now, this is the micro rays. Micro rays are like, we'll look at tens of thousands of, of, uh, of uh, act, uh, activations of uh, uh, pathways. And, and, and you get a lot of noise with that as well. So that's why these probabilities are not, you know, 100% per se. Now that's, that's a confounder in terms of how to evaluate the molecular microscope. Now, there's something new across the board, which is the nanostream platform. And that's something that we have here at Cedar sinai We're starting this as well. Now, the nanostream platform, we're able to go back to the uh, paraffin blocks. Now, microarrays cannot do that. And so we'll be going back to the paraffin blocks to actually see what pathways are being activated. And retrospectively, or I should say, you know, forward moving, we'll see whether or not those, uh, ac those abnormal biopsies really did mean anything in terms of... Uh, you know, progressing on to uh, graft dysfunction. Stay tuned for the follow on that. Okay, great. So we have a lot of people on the call still. Uh, so we're moving from the paraffin block to uh, <laughs> closer to cardiology. And Leandro Sliptruck, who you may also recall from CEDARS, says, uh, imaging, uh, great lecture. Uh, great to see you again. Could you comment on the use of cardiac MRI for rejection? Are you using it clinically? Yes. Uh, yes, we are using it clinically for patients where we do, we're not quite sure as to what's happening. All right. So when you look at uh, MRIs, we look at T1, T2 relaxation times. When you look at relaxation times, they are uh, suggestive of edema, something going on within the myocardium itself. And then we look at late gadolinium enhancement. When you look at uh, LGE providing, <laughs> providing you know, your kidney functions okay, it represents or can represent fibrosis. And so we'll look at, you know, if we're looking at uh, someone who's got graft dysfunction, we see a lot of fibrosis, and then we'll do a usually rubidium PET scan to look at coronary flow reserve for those patients. Why? We're looking for small vessel disease. You know, and if we do see that in addition to the fibrosis, game's over. You know, those patients, either they are not going to survive or you think about retransplantation. So that's what we do on those patients. Now, if we have the, you know, L, you know we have just uh, T1, T2, T2, T2 T1, T2 relaxation times that are, that are prolonged, then we'll look at volumes. If you look at the, ex, the, uh, the left ventricular volume, if that's increased and you get relaxation times that are elevated, that's highly suggestive of rejection as well. So there are some things that we can look at and we can garner from the MRI, and that would more or less help us to move along what pathway in terms of rejection, no rejection, <laughs> and then we'll probably do a molecular microscope intergraph mRNA transcripts to see which therapies humoral, cellular, you know, types of uh, uh, treatments uh, for these patients. 
Great. Another imaging question. I think you already answered, um, but Mario Garcia, who you may know is our chief here, says a fantastic presentation. And, you know, we're in the Bronx. We always keep working. Uh, while you were giving your lecture, I must have read several echo studies done for transplant surveillance. Is there still a role for imaging in the asymptomatic patients or surveillance imaging? No, oh, absolutely. You know, and, and in fact, many many of us believe that we probably can uh, surveil for rejection just by using the echocardiogram and uh, clinical acumen. Um, yes. But on these clinical trials, you know, whether image trial or not, uh, there was never a third arm of do nothing <laughs> except, yeah. except for the echo. So yeah, you know, I, I think you know, and yeah, obviously we look at that too. You know, we look at strain patterns. We look at uh, when yeah. look at the thickness of the myocardium, we look at di diastolic dysfunction. There's a lot of things that we can you know, garner from the echocardiogram. Great. I think, uh, Snehala, if you're on and I, I see you unmute yourself, if you have a question, can, let's see if we can hear you. Oh, yeah. Um, hey, John. Fantastic talk. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, um, and uh oh, I think Snehal, you're going in and out with your audio. <laughs> um, appreciation, uh, you know, as a transplant well as many others. I'll put it through the chat. Yeah, just, yeah, just text me your question. I'll put it in the chat. Meanwhile, I, I will ask uh, my own question, which is um, the online calculator, right, mm -hmm. for the mm -hmm. risk of uh, coronary artery vasculopathy. Um, I, I think you could use this at the time of uh, organ acceptance almost, or do you think this is still limited yeah. because you only have one year data? And then I have a follow up uh, question. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, you know, in the future, you know, we would like to apply the cardiac eye box to many, many uh, issues, you know, and I, and I think we just have to look at the uh, donor characteristics. We, we have to be a little more granular in terms of the donor characteristics. And as you know, too, you know, donor, donor selection is an art. I mean, I wish we had a simple algorithm to use, but it really depends on, you know, uh, the severity of the abnormalities of the donor, meaning how thick is thick, how old is too old, you know, and how much uh, weight does each one have depending on the gradation of the abnormalities. Not to, you know, and also the recipient, right? <laughs> Your recipient too has to be put into that, you know, factor as well. You know, uh, is the recipient on a VAD? Is it going to take more time to get, get the VAD out? Are you going to uh, need a more robust donor heart because of that? Pulmonary hypertension, I can go right down the list, you know, in terms of what you actually do need for these patients. So I think over time that will be the case. And, uh, you know, uh, you might imagine uh, Loopy is working, we're working with Loopy uh, in terms yeah. of the iBox more dynamic, you know, and that's what you need to have flexibility. Yeah, and John, uh, are you concerned that um, this will limit the transplantation rate? Like perfect, perfect is the enemy of good. We we predict the outcome, right? We have gone over the years through using hepatitis. Now our program, I tell you, over fifty percent uh, OCS at this point, DCD, uh, higher risk uh, at this moment. But that's what we uh, can get for our recipients. Are you concerned that? Uh, Perfection uh, may lead to death, <laughs> but we're just not getting transplanted. No, no, I'm not really that uh, concerned. Why? Because we're we're all in this to save lives. Yeah. You know, at, at the end of the day, you know, the more lives we save, the better. And you know, the UNOS is doing better in terms of risk uh, adjustments. So yes, we're taking on higher risk patients, but they're also being risk adjusted. You know, in that light as well. Not perfect, not perfect. I just rolled off the MPSC, so I know it's not perfect, you know, but at least it's a uh, stab in the right direction so that we can take on these higher risk patients, higher risk donors, uh, and we're just trying to uh, amend the uh, risk adjustment uh, uh, portfolios. Okay. You know you wouldn't get away without a provocative question from me. Of course. So. Um, I do want to respect everybody's time. We're going to stay on, John, if you have five minutes for us. Uh, sure. really, if you can disconnect the, the YouTube feed uh, or the channel so that we have uh, uh, just privacy among whoever is on and can listen in because uh, we have a complex case. I don't know, Yogita, if you're okay. able to Give share me your a moment. screen. There she Allow is. Me okay. yeah. Allow me one moment. Yeah. Allow me one moment. Yeah. And I will stop the... Great.